All right, hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody here today to our church. That's our hand right there. That's our hand right there to the community, to everybody. Anybody saying who's seeking God, let's up our hands right out to you, man. Because we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God, so our hands should be all out, right? It should be, it should be out all the time, too. Anywhere we step, man, it should be out. Amen. We serve God. All right. Um, I'm Pastor Kelly. Thank you for joining us today. Um, here, everybody here, we have a guest. Thank you for joining us. Uh, people on Facebook, thanks for joining us. And uh, today, well, I got, we got some good stuff coming up today. So I'm going to start off with this. In 1966, who was alive then? Raise your hand if you're alive in 1966. All right, 1966, a singer, um, singer's name was Percy Sledge. And I'll raise your hand if you know who this is, Percy Sledge. He released an album called When a Man Loves a Woman. And, when, and the song, a man loves a, When a Man Loves a Woman, was on his, uh, his uh, album that he, that he put out. I guess it's a record probably, or eight, I don't know if they had eight tracks. I don't know if that was back then. But whatever he put out, he had this song called When a Man Loves a Woman. And the song hit number one in the US in the United States and is considered one of the greatest songs ever produced. And uh, in 1991, so some years later, a singer named Mike, Michael Bolton. Raise your hand if you know Michael Bolton. You heard of him. Okay, Michael Bolton, he also he also sang the same song and it and it and it, and it has some success. And uh, um the song on, uh, on Mike, for Michael Bolton was, uh, it's on his uh, CD, Time, Love, and Tenderness. And uh, actually, I think I have his CD at home. But it became a hit again. And I want to show you some of the lyrics. Um, I want to show you some of the lyrics to that song that, became, that was a hit. It says, when a man loves a woman, when a man loves a woman, can't keep his mind on nothing else. He'll trade the world. For the good thing he's found, if she is bad, he can't see it. She can do no wrong. Turn his back on his best friend if you put her down. When a man loves a woman, spend his very last dime or nickel. Trying to hold on to what he needs. He'd give up all his comfort, sleep out in the rain if she said that's the way it ought to be. And you're probably wondering why I'm saying these lyrics right now. You're probably, you're probably wondering why I'm saying these lyrics. And no, this isn't a Soul Train, um, I'm not having a Soul, a soul Train flashback. You remember, does anybody remember Soul Train? Remember Soul Train? And this is right here, this was Don Cornelius. He was the, uh, the um, he was the host of Soul Train. And um, remember Soul Train, it was singers, singers would come out and they would sing and people would dance. But this isn't a Soul Train sermon. Just let you know right now, it's not a Soul Train sermon. But today's message is about the God, about God's love for us. God loves God's love for you. And the truth about the truth about um, is that is that God's love for it is one of the greatest love stories in history. And it involves us and it involves God. And God loves us like a man loves a woman. Amen. Amen. And for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be we're gonna be in the book of Hosea. And this book gives us great insight in uh, of God's love for us. And let's set the foundation right now. How many of you read, the, raise your hand if you read the book of Hosea. All right, it's a good book. It's a great book, actually. So let's set the foundation. So Hosea was a prophet who lived in the northern, in northern Israel. And he lived during King Jer Jeroboam's, the second reign as Israel's king. And like all of Israel's, all of Israel's kings, like Jer Jeroboam II, he was evil. All of, Je all of Israel's kings were evil. And this is after this is what they split. And, and although Israel prospered politically and materially under King Jeroboam II's reign, it was, a, it was a time of significant spiritual and moral decay. Spiritual and moral decay. Whenever you say the word decay, that's, that's never going to be good, is it? Sometimes we have teeth in our mouth that decay. We got to go see the dentist. Sometimes we have a tree that decays and we have to go get it cut down because it's no longer healthy. So let's go, let's go to 2 Kings right here. We're going to go to 2 Kings 
chapter 14, verses 23 to 24. It's on the overhead if you didn't bring your Bible. In the, fifth, the 15th year of um, Amaziah, the king of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam II, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. Samaria was the capital of, of Israel. It was north Israel, south was Judah. It's verse 24 gives us some more insight. It says, he did evil. I remember he said, did evil. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn from all the idolatrous sins of Jer Jeroboam the first, which was Israel's first king, the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin. So Jeroboam the second was Israel's 13th king. 13. In verse 24 says, Jeroboam the second did not turn away from sin like Israel's first king, Jeroboam. In both... Kings were deeply involved in the worship of idols. Idols. And the, there's a saying out there that I've heard before. It says, the apple doesn't fall from the tree. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. The apple doesn't fall, far, um, fall, from, far, fall far from the tree. And this popular, this popular say, um, saying typically means that children inherit some of the same traits as their parents. Sometimes you, you, you might come across a family... And the, kid, the, 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 the parents are kind of shady, and the, the, the kids are shady, and that's what it's talking about here. But I want to I wanna look at it like, I'm going to look at it from a different standpoint. The apple doesn't fall far, fall far from nations at times. Amen. From nations, not just families, but nations. And this was true for Israel. There were many Israelites that, in, that had inherited evil traits and developed bad behaviors like past generations of Israel, of, of, of God's chosen people. And idol worship was prevalent in the house of Israel. Idol worship. And it really didn't matter what king left and came. Many were being led to sin because of the leadership. And we know that sin causes separation with God. So if you if you know somebody who's sinning, to me I, I'm saying I would keep I would be wise about it and keep my distance from them because you know what because it likes to attract things. Sin likes sin has a sin has a a, a sparkly type of look to it, and lots of people engage in it. So you got to be careful with sin because ultimately it's going to lead to separation with God. And the book of Hosea shines a light on this reality. So the title of today's series is going to be a multi-week multi series. The title of today's series is called He Loves Us and Stuff on the Street. He Loves Us, part number one. So let's pray, then we're going to get right into this, this good message right here. So dear God, I just pray today, God, that this message is anointed. God, I pray that... Um, God, that it saturates our, our, our mind, spirit, and soul, God. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will water this, this message. God, water these seeds so they can grow up and we can, um, they can produce fruit. That's what your, your kingdom is based on, fruit. We want to see fruit, amen? So God, thank you for today. And I thank you for everybody who could join us here in person and online. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. amen. All right, so the book of Hosea is a 25-year compilation compilation of preaching and writing by the prophet Hosea that is mostly poetry. And the book reveals the deep truths about God's character in human nature. God has a character. God has a, 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 a character. God and we have and us humans have a certain nature. Amen. And God's character is holy and human nature is sinful. That's pretty black and white with that. So we're going to be, we're going to turn to, we're going to turn to uh, Hosea, starting with verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 right here. It says, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So the, the name Hosea means salvation. And throughout the book, Hosea will show us that salvation is found in turning to the Lord and away from sin. And at the time of Hosea, the kingdom of Israel was split into two kingdoms after the death of King Solomon, which was around 975 BC. And this is up on the screen right here, if you don't, if you don't know. Judah was in the south and Israel was in the north. Judah's capital was Jerusalem and Israel's capital was Samaria. If you didn't know this yet. 
But the split, the split, the split that took place in, in, in with Israel, it was prophesied in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 11, chapter 11, verses 30 through 31. Prophesied. Do you understand the Bible is 30% prophecy? Things that are going to, 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 to take place, things that have, have taken place, have already been prophesied. The rapture is the next most is the next biggest uh, prophetic event that's going to happen, is the rapture. So let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 30 and 31. It says, then um, Ahijah, and, 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 and Ahijah was a prophet from the tribe of um, Levi. He took hold of the new cloak, which was he was wearing, and tore it into 12 pieces. That represented the, 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 the kingdom was split. He said to Jeroboam, Israel's first king, take 10 pieces for yourself. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, behold, I am going to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. It splits. Churches split. The nation of Israel is split. And we're here now. There's a split. So let's go to, let's, uh, let's go to uh, Hosea uh, verse 2. One verse 2 says, when the, Lord, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, because the God was using Hosea. The Lord said to him, and this is something that's very, that was very, it, it doesn't really make sense. It really doesn't make sense. Sometimes, have you ever, has God ever said something to you and it doesn't make sense? Many times he doesn't make sense and it doesn't really matter if it makes sense. I want to tell you right now and encourage you to be obedient because there's a reason for what he's asking you to do. So he says, he says, the Lord said to him, but first of all, I want to say, it's good that, that God speaks. It's good that you can hear. We're learning downstairs about hearing God. And that is very important in our walk. And this is what the Lord said to him. He said, go, take yourself a wife of prostitution. Come on, man. That does not make sense. That, that, does, that story does not start off good. Take your wife, yourself a wife of prostitution and have children with her. Of prostitution, for the land commits great acts of prostitution by not following the Lord. So God tells Hosea to go get yourself a prostitute, a hoe, a whore, or whatever you want to call it. Say, but that, why would God do this? Why would God say, go get a prostitute? It doesn't make sense. I don't know. Does it make sense to you? Yes or no? Wait, yes, no. Yes or no? It doesn't make sense. And the reason, but, the, but God always has a reason for what he asks you to do or why he does it the way he does. The reason why God chose this plan is because he was painting a picture of himself in Israel. That's what he was doing. It was his Picasso. When God first established the nation of Israel, a marriage took place. A marriage took place. Israel was the bride and God was the groom. However, Israel prostituted itself with other nations and chased after other gods, and this led to idolatry. My gosh, the Bible talks about idolatry a lot. But the reason why God told, told Hosea to do what he, um, what, he, what he told him to do is because he was, he was, going to, he was trying to send a message to Israel. He was trying to... He was trying to let them know. Because sometimes, sometimes people don't listen. Sometimes God speaks and people don't listen. Amen. And God's not a, a, a mean God and a rough God. He's not going to get a two by four and hit you in the head with it. But sometimes God has to say things and do things for you to wake up. Everybody say, wake up. We got to wake up at times in our walk. We have to wake up with our relationship with him. And God, and this is what God was talking, telling Israel through Hosea. He does it through us all the time. Sometimes, do you understand that God uses you at times to talk to people? Amen. And sometimes what he asks you to say is not always the greatest thing to say, but you still got to say it. Eternity is on the line. Let that sink in for a minute. You don't say something God tells you to say and that person dies and goes to hell. How are you going to feel about it? Not so good. All right, let's go to Hosea. We're going to be in chapter uh, uh, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. So Hosea, he did what he was supposed to do. Hosea went and took Gomer. My gosh, that was a crazy name. Gomer, I don't know any woman named Gomer. Gomer. 
He took Gomer and she conceived and bore him a son. His name was Jezreel, which means scattered. And this has a significance right here because the name Jezreel was a soon to be reality for Israel. The nation soon would be scattered in exile by the conquering Assyrian army. It was going to happen. And it did happen. You know what? When God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Let's go to verse 6 right now. We're going to jump over a little bit um, um, throughout the, the book of Hosea. Gomer, man, I just can't get over that name. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And her name was um, Lo uh, Ruhama, which means no mercy. The name Lo Ruhama was another soon to be reality for Israel. The nation was soon, would soon receive no mercy by God um, and was going to be decimated by the Assyrian army. No mercy. You don't want to hear, you, want, you don't want to hear no mercy in God in the same sentence. Amen. You don't want to hear that. We need mercy. We need grace. We need mercy. Amen. But let's go to let's jump to verse 7. But, that's always a good thing to hear. But, but, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will rescue them from the Lord their God. So, Israel, everybody say no. Israel, um, I mean, Israel, no. Judah, yes. And why did he say that? God had mercy on Judah and rescued them from destruction from Assyria because some of their king's hearts were positioned towards God. Some. Throughout the whole book of the Bible, God always, a remnant always remains. There's always, there's usually somebody, one person's usually righteous. And God, because he loves us, doesn't destroy everybody. In, in the kings of Judah, the south, in the south, there were some good kings, some holy kings, some righteous kings. And he didn't destroy them, but he destroyed Israel. It's good to be righteous. Is it, and amen? It's good to be righteous. And let's go to Psalms. Psalms 11, 7 says this. It says, for the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The all right will see his face. When you are righteous, you will see God's face. When you are righteous, the whole nation can be being destroyed. But he will see your face and protect you. Amen. That's an amen right there. It's good to be righteous. Now I believe that God protects and watches over the upright and the righteous. And the upright and righteous are more likely to see his face and experience his presence. That's what we want to do. We want to experience God's presence. We want to experience him. And this is exactly how it was for Judah and not Israel. Too bad. I guess it's too bad for Israel. But it, that's the way they chose. Everything in life is a choice. You choose if you come to church. You choose if you pray. You choose if you read the Bible. Amen. Nobody's going, no, I can't make you do it. Maybe if I got a gun to your head and stuff, you still might not choose. But it doesn't really matter. But you, if life is about a choice, it's about choices. So let's go to um, let's go to um, Hosea chapter uh, or chapter one again, eight and verses eight and nine. It says Gomer conceived and gave birth to another son, and his name was Lo Ami, which means not my people. Everybody say not my people. Once again, the name Loami, Jezreel, uh, Loami was assumed to be a reality for Israel. God will soon tell the house of Israel they are not his people. Don't want to hear that. Everybody say, I don't want to hear that. Don't want to don't hear, don't want to hear that saying, you're not my people. You don't want to see, you don't want to hear when you get that, when you're standing before Jesus, I don't know you. Same thing. Same principle, amen? It's the same principle. But Hosea's second son was, would soon be a daily reminder to him, as well as Israel, that, that the people of Israel had pushed God away and they were no longer considered his people. And I believe this is a word for the church. The church cannot keep on pushing God away and expect him to be there for them. And the church has to, put, has to quit playing games. If, you're at, if you say you're a church, you have, to, you have to function like one and be on mission like one. And this is what God was telling the nation of Israel, the, the house of Israel. Man, if you say you love me, you better love me. Don't, love, don't say you love me like a man does sometimes to a woman and punch her right in her face and kick her and call her names that she shouldn't be called. Amen? That's what, that's what, that's what God was, 
That's what Hosea was saying through, uh, God was saying through Hosea to the nation of Israel. Man, you say you love me, but no, everything, your behavior is not saying it because you're worshiping these idols. Everybody say, get right. Get right. Israel has to, they need to get right. And Hosea, Hosea who was who God used. The prophet Hosea it was who God used to help Israel get right. Do you understand? Our job as a church is to help the world. Everybody say, get right. We're, our job as a church is to help people get right. The sinners, the lost, and everybody in between. That's our job. But God wanted Israel to get serious about the relationship with him because God says, you know what, Israel, I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of playing games. You're playing games because when you play games, just like a game, it's over eventually. And God said the game is over now. It's done. And God used Hosea, just like I said, he uses us to convey this reality. And that Hosea's marriage to his wife Gomer was a prophetic symbol of God's relationship with Israel. God's relationship with Israel was strained. Have you ever been in a strained relationship before? You see the person, but it's not what it should be. You do it still, but it doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that it's good. It doesn't mean that it's fruitful. Israel's relationship at this time was difficult. And it was like being married to a prostitute. Can you depend on a prostitute? No. Will a prostitute be faithful? Probably not. She gets paid to do things. Let's be real about it. Can you trust a prostitute? Probably not. I don't think you can do this. I don't think you can trust a prostitute. The point of all this was that Israel was acting like a prostitute and the relationship with God was in a state of crisis. The world we live in is in a state of crisis. And any time your relationship with God isn't right, the chance of chaos and craziness increases substantially. And you're more prone to accidents. You're more likely to fall and trip. Bad things are more likely to happen. And the truth is, is when you're not walking close to God, you live in a compromised state. Compromise. I want to turn to four, uh, um, Psalms. I'm sorry, my... Oh, I'm missing some of my slides. I'm missing some of my slides. All right. So besides that, I went past. I got too geeked up. All right. Psalms 46.1. I'm sorry. I've been lost. I'm saying I'm just, I'm just preaching, man. Um, Psalms 46.1 says, God is our refuge and strength, mighty and impenetrable, impenetrable, a very presence and well-proved help in trouble. When you're not walking with God, you're going to get yourself in some trouble. And you don't have to believe me. Just go do it then. And see if you don't wind up somewhere you shouldn't be. Jail. Dead. It don't really matter. You pick, what, you pick, you pick the consequence. But, but we have to be real. We have to be real. We have to be real. There's trouble always around us. Amen? There's always trouble around us. It's, and, I, and I want you to listen to this. Sometimes it finds us, and sometimes we find it. You don't got to go too far to find trouble. You actually got to go down, just walk down the street, step out your house. Or you can find trouble in your house, too. It, don't, it, don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate. It's not hard to find. And that's two bad, two bad qualities of it. And this is one of the many, the many reasons. Everybody say many. Everybody say many. M-A-N-Y. Say many again. Say it again. Many. This is one of the many reasons why we need God. Because God sustains us. I want to go to Psalms 3.3. I like the Psalms. It says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. The attacks of the devil. The devil's always throwing out fiery darts. You got a shield in front of you and they can't hit you. My glory and my honor. And the one who lifts my head. 
Ooh. King David in Psalms 3, 3 said, King David was telling, he says that God is the lifter of his head. Amen. Every, look at your neighbor and say, God lifts my head. God lifts your head. God lifts my head. God lifts everybody's head. He lifts our head every morning. He keeps our, our hearts beating each day. He, gives, he provides us food and shelter. He keeps us safe and healthy. That's a good God. That's all I, all I can say is that God does a lot for each one of us. Amen? Amen? And this is what the nation of Israel, this is what lots of Christians forget, is that God does so much for us. They forget. So God turned his back on them. The word, one of the worst things in life is to have somebody turn their back on you. Amen. I don't know you. So I'm turning my back and walking the other way. And this is, and this is what God said. He said, if you don't want me, then I'll go. So what happened? God went. God went. And this is up on this, over here, right here. God will never force himself on you. He's not going to do it. He loves us, but he doesn't control us. If, he, if God controlled us, the relationship would be one-sided. However, God loves us. And this is up on the overhead right here. We serve a God who gives us chance after chance after chance. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. Aren't you thankful that, like I'm saying, that what you did yesterday or two weeks ago or last year or ten years ago, he is not holding that up against you? Amen. And he's not, he's, he's holding his voice from you? That's a good God. That's a God, I'm saying, that's a God that the world doesn't understand. The world does not understand the God we serve. Our job is to tell people this, this reality, this truth. Well, let's go to 1 John 1, 9. It says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Amen. The God we serve is a God of love and grace. And if, this, if you're like me, I'm sure like I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not anything, I'm just a normal person. If you're like me, that's hard to understand. That's hard to understand that, that God is just full of love and grace. Why would God, why does God treat us like he does when he has every reason not to? That's a question that I'm saying, that's a question, that's a million dollar question right there. But it's, it's really simple, it's because he loves us. He loves us. Let's continue with, let's continue with verse, uh, verse 10. So up to this point right here, up to this point right here, God has talked about Israel's judgment. Because God is the God that judges. But, but now he flips the script in verse 10 and talks about restoration because we serve a God of restoration. Thank God. Is this, is this is Hosea 1 10. It says, Yet the number of sons of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured in, or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, but in the place where it is said to them, you are, my, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. God tells us in this, in, in, in this verse right here that the nation of Israel will increase like the sand of the sea. Do you understand there's a lot of sand? Can you count sand? Have you ever tried to count sand? A particle of sand? I'm saying, let me tell you something. Don't waste your time because you're going to be there all day. You'll, you'll, spend, you'll spend the rest of your life counting sand and it's, it's not worth it because it's a lot of sand. But this is, this, what God said in verse 10 is a reversal from earlier where God said Israel would be scattered. He wouldn't be their God or have mercy for them. We have to remember that we serve a God um, whose main purpose is to restore. God's, God, God loves restoration. He loves when families are reunited. He loves when you, you come up, when, when a drug addict is, it comes off of drugs, when an alcoholic gets clean, when a family comes together that was divorced. 
He loves restoration. Thank God for us. Because he sent Jesus for us. And this is Hosea 111. It says that, that then the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel shall be gathered together. And they will appoint for themselves one leader. And they will go up from the land for, the, for great and glorious will be the day of Jezreel. So God said the nations of, of Judah and Israel who were divided would once again unite. Everybody say united. united. And we can, we, can, we can say, we can say that the promise, we can say that, that the promise, one way that the promise, this, this promise was, was fulfilled was the institution of the church. Because the church brought together Israel, Judah, and look at your neighbor and say, even Gentiles. And even Gentiles, even all of us, and into one body. We are grafted. If you're a Gentile, you're, we are, we've been grafted into God's family. Amen. And this was all accomplished through Jesus. That's why we, that's why we, that's why we just, we, we, we praise him because he is worthy of it all. So let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 2.14 says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. Thank God for peace. He united, he united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. God himself brought peace to, to, to the earth. And the great thing about this is we can all we can we can all live in peace and walk in peace if we choose to live for God. And this is the key piece of the puzzle. You have to choose to live for God, and only you can make that choice. Everybody here, every day. You know what? We talk about, well, you know what, I choose God on Sundays, but you, you know what? You've got six more days of the week to choose God, to live for God, to walk with God, to walk in the Spirit. Amen. And God wants you to choose to walk in the spirit. He wants you to choose heaven over, over, over your flesh. He wants you to choose him over everything else. Because when you choose, that, when you choose him over everything else, everything else is going to work out. It's going to work out. Amen. All right. We're about to close. We're about before we close. I'm gonna. I want to give four. I want to. I want to leave you with four ways to live for God. Four ways to live for God. There's many other ways to live for God, but these are something that God dropped into my. He deposited into my spirit. God. He makes a lot of deposits every day. Do that. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to go here. I want you to whatever. He's always depositing. And. It's our job to, we gotta be, you know what, you can get you can get too much money in there, you gotta give out. He gives it to you so you can you can release it and tell people. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell your, your co-workers. It's not worth being rich by yourself. Buy your neighbor a jacket. Alright, so um, four ways to live for God. Number one, I think it popped down here, walk in the spirit. And this means asking. This means always. I should. I forgot this. So it should. This means always asking, seeking, and chasing after God. And when you do this, you'll be where God wants you to be. And this is this is a this is a very this is a factual thing. I believe. And when you when you, when it's very hard to walk in the spirit and do something stupid. <laughs> it's very hard to walk in the spirit and do something stupid. It's very, to, it's very hard to walk in sin in the spirit. I don't think you, I'm saying, when you're walking, when you're doing it God's way and you're walking with God, I think it's, it's one of those things that safeguards you from just doing something stupid that you regret later in life or later that day. Because it's very easy, it's very easy to trip and, 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 trip and fall into sin. It's very easy. You're one choice away from doing it. That's why we have to keep our mind, we have to look up to heaven, always keep our eyes focused on God. 
And you don't, and, and I know sometimes it's very, it's a sound, it sounds like a very, um, it sounds like a very, um, I don't know, want to say just something that's very simple, but it's, a, it's a something that is, is true though. Keeping your eyes focused on, 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 on God is, is something that is, it's an easy thing to do every day. So walking in the spirit, we're called to walk in the spirit. All right, number second way to, to uh, live for God is to deny the flesh. This kind of goes with walking in the spirit. When you walk in the spirit, you are denying the flesh. The flesh can't rise up. So denying the flesh means choosing God over your desires. It means choosing God over things you might crave or want. We all have cravings, don't we? We, have cra we crave for things. We, have, we, have, we want things. And it may, seem, it may seem tough, but you, you can do it. We can do it. God gave us the Holy Spirit. To help us in our times of weaknesses. Our times of weakness. And let's be honest. There are many times throughout the day that we, that we could possibly, that, that we may be weak or we could be weak. Is that true for you? Amen? Amen. There are many times when we could be weak. There are, time, there are many times we want to do or say something that isn't holy and righteous. I don't know about you. I'm saying, I don't know about you, but I'll just be honest with you. So there's times when you just, there's things you want to do and say that are not holy and righteous. Somebody, somebody cuts you off. Somebody does something to you. Saying, the flesh is rising. Oh, come on, say it. Just say, you know, you want to say it. You want to say it. You want to say it. But don't say it. But that's, that's why, that's why. We, I know we all thank God that we, the Holy Spirit's with us because the Holy Spirit, when, right when it's about to come out your mouth, the Holy Spirit will just like pinch your lips and just like, shut up. Amen. All right, third way to live for God is to choose peace. We live for God when we choose peace over war, peace over confrontation, peace over arguments. And whenever we choose peace, God, God, God wants us to make that choice. Because the, the Bible call, calls us to be peacemakers. Not to go around throwing grenades at people. It's easy to throw a grenade and leave, a, and leave destruction. That's what the world does. When somebody, when, when a man and woman get together and have sex and the dad, they create a child and the man leaves and the woman leaves, that's destruction. Because a mom and dad need a, 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 a mom and dad, amen? They need a mom and dad. They need a family. The family unit right now is being is being attacked by Satan right now, because Satan knows that 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 of the family um, that, the, that 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 the world needs a family in order to ex um, correctly function. So the devil's going after kids. He's going after he's going after he's just going after families. We have to we just have to we just have to put on our armor of God every day, not be exposed. And just, and just, I'm saying, live the way God asks us to live. Amen. All right. In the fourth way, final, fourth and final way to live for God is to obey. Pretty, pretty simple right there. Obey. Living for God is about obedience. And obedience is a respect thing. When we're, obe when we're obedient, we're telling God that we respect him. Because you know, like when, when you're not being obedient and, and like your parents tell you not to eat candy or do something, you know, like it's like when you do it, that's not being respectful to them. You're just like, I don't care what my mom says or dad says. But when we're obedient, we're telling God we respect him, that we cherish him over everything else in, the, in our life. Everything. Obedience. Obedience. You know what? Obedience will keep you, obedience will keep you alive. You know, like you do something stupid and don't obey God and stuff, you might you might be coming to your funeral. I don't want to go to, I don't want to do another funeral. I know last year I think I did two or three already. That's too many. That's too many. God wants us alive because 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 we have a job to do. We have a mission. Everybody like everybody said we got a mission. We got a mission. And we're gonna keep on. We're gonna keep on that mission until until it's until we're told when we to, to we're called home um, or raptured. Amen. But next week we're gonna we're gonna continue in the book of Hosea. And we're gonna see that the nation of Israel did not respect God. They didn't obey God, and as a result, God got angry and He had to discipline them. He had to discipline them. But one thing that we have to realize is there's always gonna be a consequence for disobedience. 
That's the first thing I want you to, I want you to realize. There's, there's always going to be a consequence for disobedience. And the second thing I want to, I want to let you know, I want you to uh, leave you with is, um, it's better to receive the consequence now than later. You know, sometimes people, people kill people, people kill people, people do lots of sin, and they think they got, they got away with it. No, it's just that you haven't got caught yet, you haven't got a consequence. But when God corrects you, you should thank God that he corrects you, that, that he's not letting you just, like, live stupid. Because there's a lot of people in the world, a lot of people in the world that live stupid, a lot of Christians that live stupid. I've done something, they did something, they didn't get caught, there was no consequence, and they keep on doing it again, and again, and again, and again. And eventually, you know what, when it's judgment time, you know what? The worst thing, like I said, the worst thing to hear is just like, I don't know you. That's we don't want to hear that, do we? And this is up on the this is up on the overhead right here. God wants us to deal with sin before sin deals with us. Because sin, like that little fish in a bowl, sin a lot of times sin seems so small. Oh my, it's not gonna hurt me if I gossip. It's not gonna hurt if I steal something. It's not gonna hurt me if I do something I know that. I shouldn't do, then eventually that sin grows and grows and gets bigger. And after that, you know what happens? Then it eats you. It eats you. And you're just like, how did this happen? Well, it happened because you weren't being obedient. You weren't listening. And you weren't dealing with it. God wants us to deal with things in our life. You know, something should not fester for 30 years. You know, um, if you have something that you're dealing with, you, you shouldn't let it go. Let God deal with it. Let God heal you from that. Amen. So this is why, and this is why the need for examination is so important. As I stated last week, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. Not just physically. Not to make sure that we don't have any bumps or like bumps on our head or on our legs or anything like that, but spiritually examination. Why am I feeling so mad? Why am I, why am I just so hostile? Why do I feel so like, why do I, why do I feel so beefy about, about this or that or whatever? God says, you know what? Examine and bring it to me and I will take care of it. Amen. All right, if you could join me in prayer, if you could bow your heads right now and join me in prayer. Right now, I just want to, I want to pray right now that we all have our, our number one goal, a number one goal and priority in life is to live for God. Right now, dear God, I just, I just thank you for today's sermon. God, thank you for the book of Hosea, God, because Hosea opened up our eyes to Israel's sin. Israel just like, just their, their disconnect from God. And it was both Israel and it was, and eventually Judah was taken over by the Babylonians. But it just, it just, it, 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 it we, I believe that we are called to remember. We're, we're, we're called to remember our past. Where we're called to remember um, things that happened so we can learn from them. There's been so many people in history that have tripped and fell into sin and it's taken them to hell. And God, we know that you don't want us to go there. You don't want anybody to go to hell. You don't want anybody to um, end up just dying and doing something stupid to get themselves there. So that's one of the reasons why you gave us the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can bring things to remembrance. So God, we thank you for today. We thank you for we thank you for the prophet Hosea, God. And God, I just pray that this, you know, everything today that was said, that was that was preached, God, it, it goes into our spirit, God. And, and God, just just water, Holy Spirit, water that so we can live in remembrance. We wanna we wanna remember everything that you did for your people. We want we wanna remember all the the good things, the bad things, because that shapes of shapes us who we are. So God, thank you for. Thank you to, for bringing the book of Hosea um, to, 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 to like for me, so I can so I can teach about it, and hopefully, just really, um, you can use it to just to, to help people mature, like mature and grow in you. We thank you. Right now, I just want to ask anybody right now: if you die today, if you passed away, whatever what you want to say, if you passed away or died today, do you know where you were going? Where you you would be going? Because. Every religion besides Christianity, they just hope that they're going somewhere. They don't know where they're going to go, and that's not a good place to, 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 um, to be. 
When you go on a vacation, you don't want to be like, well, I hope I'm going to get there. No, you have a plan route. You have a plan map where you know every turn. You know every 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 toll bridge or whatever it may be that you're going you're going that you're going to come across. Um, it's the same way with salvation. You can know where you're going to go. All you have to do is just make Jesus Lord of your life. So. If you don't, if Jesus is not the Lord of your life, and you want to, you want to, you want to know where you're going to go after you breathe your last breath, I want you to raise your hand. If you're on, if you're on Facebook Live, I can't see you, but I'm still going to pray for you because I don't want to, I don't want you to miss this opportunity. So if this is you. This is a prayer of salvation. It's a salvation prayer, and it's asking Jesus to be your Lord and to forgive you of all your sins. So if you can repeat this after me, if you, wherever, whoever it is, dear God, I know I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for forgiveness right now. I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I believe that God raised Him from the dead, Father God. Thank you for saving me, taking away my sins, and giving me true life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this was you, and you just asked Jesus, you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. That's a great, this is the greatest, uh, greatest thing, greatest, greatest thing on earth. Um, is just knowing where you're going to spend eternity, because you know that our life is, our lives are temporary. Uh, we, you know, some, most of them, I think we get like 80, 90 years, 70 years, but we, we're going to spend eternity somewhere. It's going to either be heaven or it's going to be hell. So you just chose heaven. Amen. So the next steps I would, I'd like, I would encourage you to do is to find a church that you can, um, you can become a part of. You can, you're going to have lots of questions probably, just like all of us did when we first got saved and made the conversion. And uh, you need somebody to walk with you, which is disciple. Um, Jesus told, Jesus says in Matthew to um, be a disciple and make disciples. And we want to disciple you in, your new, in this new walk. You're going to have lots of questions. I'm just telling you right now, you're going to have lots of questions. Because I have lots of questions still. <laughs> but um, I just encourage you to find a church. If you have no church, you can, uh, we'd love you to come here to Lansing Calvary. We'd like to walk with you and talk to you and just really, just really get to know you. But for the rest of us right here, um, is it, um, does anybody have any prayer, prayer needs or prayer requests today? Because because God wants to God wants wants God God wants you to come to Him if you if you feel any burdens if you have any burdens if you have any needs right now. Does anybody have any needs? Okay. 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 So this is what we're going to do and stuff like this. Because you know what? I believe that the gifts are not just gifts. You know, just for us to use, they're used for, for the world, for people. So what I want you to do now, if you're able and you're willing, <laughs> is to go back there. I want you to pray for it. I want you to pray for Luffy's son.
I was going to pray a prayer right quick. This is a prayer of blessing for Numbers. Uh, I think it's Numbers 6, 24 to 26. May the Lord bless you and protect you this week. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you this week. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace this week. Dear God, I just I just ask you this week that we have some divine appointments. God, put people in our in our path, God, that you want us to um, you want us to connect with God um, so we can just share the good news, God, so we can pray for them or just maybe just talk to them, just to connect. So God, thank you for everything that you're doing um, here at Lansing Calvary. And God, we just we, we want we choose to continue to partner with you, God. So we just thank you. Keep us safe, keep us healthy, God, and and keep and, and God just continue blessing us, God. We thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Yes, the menu.